Hi, this is David Stagg, Creative Director at Shipple, the web marketing company. Today I had the opportunity to speak at the Social Media Breakfast Houston on the Next Generation website. It was held at Canopy in Houston, Texas. I hope you enjoy the video. So I, I want to ask you guys, does anybody have an idea why you would need a website instead of needing Facebook? Just, sure? You can get more personal. Per personalization, excellent. That's a great answer, yeah. You don't want to limit your brand. Right, branding, that's an excellent example as well. Anybody else? You get more detailed analytics from Detailed analytics from website. That's actually one that nobody said in our office. So that's really cool. Yes, you can get more detailed analytics. Um, I'm actually going to roll through a couple that um, people at our office said. And don't forget that our office is weird. So some of these may not make sense. But um, for example, control was one of them. Hopefully, you all can see this. I know it's kind of like, yeah, here we go. I get here. Hopefully, y'all can see my slides now. Just kidding. All right, so one of them is control. Branding was another one that we said over here. I think branding is an excellent example. Um, you can't really fully engage your audience with your company if uh, your branding is half Facebook with your logo slapped on the corner. Customization is one. You get full control of the customization of your website. You don't get that with Facebook. And I was talking to another friend who said the perfect phrase for it to me was she felt like she had to relearn Facebook every week. And I don't know if anybody else feels that way, but she was looking for her photos and she couldn't even find out where her photos were when the new layouts came out and stuff like that. So you can't really deal with uh, that kind of, when, when you can customize it the own way that you want and not have to worry about the way that Facebook's doing it, uh, customization is a big deal. They rolled out new pages last night. And there you go, they rolled out new pages last night. So we'll have to relearn that as well, so. Facebook is that you don't know when they're going to change stuff. Right, and, and like Cami said, you don't know when they're going to change stuff. Control was the first one we showed on here. I definitely think that's a huge issue. Uh, professionalism up here. Um, we have a very techie support woman at our work, and her big thing was her URL. She was like, I want to make sure that my URL is my URL. It's not Facebook.com slash whatever. I want Shipple.com. It looks a lot more professional. Uh, portability. and. I think this is probably the biggest, scariest one for Facebook because we want access to all of our data. Um, me personally, I don't upload any of my personal photos to Facebook like most people do because if Facebook goes away, I lose those. It's kind of like back in, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago when you had all your personal photos on a hard drive and then your hard drive got wiped and you freaked out and you called everybody you knew like, does anybody know about hard drives? And nobody does, of course. It's kind of the same concept but online. So I don't actually put any personal photos on there because of this. I'm worried about portability. I'm worried that I'm going to lose that data. Apples. So our business development director is a little wacky. Uh, he um, used to work for Disney as an animator, and now he sells websites. But he said apples, and his theory was apples is to oranges as Facebook is to your business, meaning don't compare the two. You can't put the two together in the same, ki in, in the same kind of uh, realm. And his more specific point was, you cannot use Facebook as a tool to take transactions for your business or organization. So I don't know if there are any nonprofit people here, but if you're a nonprofit and you can't take money, I don't know what you're going to do. Like every time we have a huge part in the nonprofit sector here in Houston, we actually target it. We love them. We try to work with them as best as we can. Uh, part of Shipple's mission and vision statement is to do good, so we try to partner with nonprofits and things of that nature. And every single one of them asks for transactions uh, of, of some kind. So um, as a business development director, the guy who said this is uh, this Apple's quote, we find that most of our innovation actually comes from our sales department. It doesn't come from like an R&D department. It doesn't really come from the uh, project managers. It's because the sales guys are out there talking to people, trying to figure out uh, what we can sell people and hearing what they need. And so they always come back to us like, all right, I need a website that hooks up with Salesforce, that mirrors sugar, that also jumps into a lead catching system that somehow exports to Razor's Edge. And, you, and, you know, and we're all just sitting there like, no, I, I, we, what? <laughs> so actually a lot of innovation comes from our sales department. And so to him, the most important thing was taking transactions. And of course, wasps. We all know that that makes sense. <laughs> um, Billionaires don't need Facebook, was one of the, what the guys said. So um, take that for what it's worth. We just work with a bunch of weird people, and I kind of like hearing what they have to say. So, um, 
I like to kind of say that my, personally, my, my word was ownership. I think that kind of falls in line with port uh, portability. Uh, I believe ownership of my data is more important. You want to make sure you have control over all that. Um, I, I think Facebook is kind of like having a party without a place. You know, you can have uh, your hats, your little fuzzy hats, you can have your pinata, you can have a caterer, you can have everything. But if we didn't have a place like Canopy to go to, that we would all be sitting around like kind of online trying to get together with each other, whatever. We couldn't actually interact face to face. So in my opinion, uh, Facebook is kind of like having a party without a place. But more importantly, um, businesses can't tolerate uncertainty. And like this gentleman just said, they rolled out new pages today. And pages are an important part of Facebook, especially for nonprofits and for, uh, you know, like some of our clients, like the Children's Museum. If we have to keep retraining them over and over and over again about how to use Facebook and stuff like this, businesses can't tolerate that. It doesn't really scale. It's not, um, it, it, it just presents a larger problem for businesses in the long run. They need some kind of, uh, I don't know how many people in this, off, or in this place have heard the word process or processes, or do we have a process for that? Um, so businesses can't tolerate that kind of lack of process. So I do want to be clear that um, Facebook is still very important. So we're going to consider this a tool, but not the destination. Obviously, everybody in here knows that Facebook is important. It's how every single person in this room probably got here today. I don't know. I, I doubt every one of you emailed each other and said, "Hey, we all going to Canopy on you know Friday I did, morning." I did use Mailchimp. How many Mailchimp is important. The Mailchimp no. Excellent, but <laughs> well, uh, I, <laughs> that's but that's actually a wonderful point because later on I'm going to talk about the fact that as a tool for uh, Facebook as being a tool, there are other tools that you can use to actually engage your audience as well. Facebook is one of them. Mailchimp is another, and we'll go through some more later. But these third-party tools are what will drive your next generation website. Don't, don't mishear me. They will drive the next generation website. Facebook just happens to be the big gorilla in the room that rules the roost right now. So um, like I said, it's a tool. It's not a destination. So let's talk for a second about, hey, Kami. Let's talk for a second about uh, the world's largest search engine. So this is a question for you all. Who knows what the number one world's largest search engine is? Google, right. OK. Don't, don't be scared. <laughs> Who knows what the number two large, world's largest search engine is? You'd think it would be Facebook. You know it because you work with our company. YouTube search, in, YouTube search bar. If you didn't know that, the second world's largest search engine is the YouTube search bar. It's not Bing. It's not any of these other things. People actually love to look for videos. Video is part of the next generation website. So you'll find out that the second largest uh, search, search engine is the YouTube search bar. But nobody actually really thinks of it like that. So like I said before, Facebook is the front runner when it comes to shaping the next generation website, but there are other things that go along with that. So um, what happens when links replace likes? So let's think about this for a second. So right now, every single one of you in here is going out and you're liking things, whether it's football or whether it's, uh, I don't know, ballet or whether it's the symphony. You're all clicking these links and these likes and everything like that. At a certain point, Facebook is going to have, and they already do have, the largest uh, like, uh, what's the word, Afghan of human culture and history. And what can they do when they finally decide to replace their search bar instead of a person showing up with anything that's relevant to you? So instead of you searching for, um, you know, Cammie Hughes, you, you search for, um, I don't know, uh, Houston Texans, and it gives you all sorts of reviews from the people that you've liked instead of the most relevant, which is what Google does. So they have this insight that can't, that can finally rival Google. So it's a crazy thought to think that eventually Facebook could take all of that data that they're tallying right now and replacing those like buttons with what, we, what I would call links like Google. And so your search bar on Facebook actually becomes this, you know, what could easily jump up and become one of the world's largest search engines. Um, it's, it's things like, uh, you're already kind of seeing it now. You go to Amazon.com, you can get reviews from people you know. And it freaks you out because you're like, I didn't, I had no idea that Iris really liked the movie Requiem for a Dream, but that's crazy. Now I know that, and so I can go talk to her about it. So um, you're already kind of seeing it now. Um, I'm going to move on and talk a little bit about location-based marketing. So uh, this is something like Foursquare, Gowalla, Scavenger. I put Facebook Places and Google Places on here. Oddly enough, they were late to the game, 
So things like Foursquare, Goala, and Scavenger currently have a leg up in that competition. And once again, I'm talking about third-party tools here that are helping to shape the next generation website. So when it comes to things like Foursquare and Goala, I'm going to come clean with you all. I, um, our company believes in candor. I don't use any of them. So I had to go out and do a little research and development, and I asked some people, why do you use Foursquare? And uh, I have a buddy named Michael who works with us. He's in our business development team. And everywhere we go, he's pulling out his you know, iPhone and he's checking into some place. And I'm like, you know, I, have, has anybody seen that website like wintogetrobbed.com or whatever? No. Yeah, please rob me. Yeah, please rob me.com when all it does is parse through people's Twitter feeds and it's says where they're. And there's a stalk me one, yeah. So it just basically aggregates when people are away from their house. So if you know the person, so uh, I've always been a little like kind of you know on the fence about. It. So I've actually never taken part in Foursquare, Goala, or Scavenger. So I asked him, and I, these are the answers that I got. He said, "Where I go and what I do is part of my story." He said he actually uses Foursquare for himself. Now a lot of us might have had diaries when we were younger. We might have had blogs or even. Shutter uh, a live journal at GeoCities or something like that at one point in, in time. This is this is the new Angel Fire. This is the new. <laughs> so he actually uses it as a part of his story. So he can look back in his history and he can say, you know, on March 13, 2009, I actually checked into, you know, so and so. And he joked around that if I checked into a bunch of strip clubs, I would know what kind of person I am. You know, you can you can tell a lot about a person by where they check in on their Foursquare or something like that. So he actually. Uses it for himself. I asked somebody else uh, the same question, and they said it allows me to ask. Uh, it allows me to ask people. Uh, it allows me to ask or people to ask me about places I've been. So if I go in and I, I see that uh, Iris has actually checked into uh, Canopy, and I've never been to Canopy for brunch, I can actually go to her at work and say, "Hey, I saw that you checked into Canopy at you know 9 a.m. and you were there for brunch," because you can put like a little blurb about what you're doing there. And I actually asked her, you know, she could tell me, hey, their brunch was excellent. And by the way, Canopy's brunch is excellent. Everybody should come try it out. <laughs> uh, it actually is really good. You are a marketer. Yeah, no. <laughs> it, it actually is really good. I'm not just saying that. So, uh, but you can actually see where other people have been, and you can ask them questions and stuff like that. So these are kind of the tools that are going to start to shape our next generation website. Um, like I said, Facebook is the front runner in all of this. Um, but there are others like location-based marketing, and there we could go on and on about some other third-party tools. Um, but, but for the most part, that's kind of the third-party uh, section of this site. And I'm going to move into what I call um, the web as an application. But before I move on, Kami, did anybody in here have any, any questions or any comments? I know this is supposed to be kind of an interactive thing. If anybody wanted to make a comment about what? Talk, if you, and if you want to talk to them on, on, about them on Twitter, you can use the SMBH tag. SMBH, yes. Hashtag SMBH. So that's what that means. When yes. You, yes. <laughs> and you can say extremely nice things because I can read them later. I We're going to have a hashtag contest to come up with a new one because everybody forgets what it is. So. Yeah. Well, let's do it. Anyway, we'll do that later. We'll do that later. Okay. <laughs> cool. So I don't know if anybody has any questions, comments, or uh, you know anything about the third party tool. Yes, ma'am. The other thing, when I started using all those uh, Foursquare and all that location, sure. and I have a G, uh, the Google phone, and et cetera, I stopped using all the location things because one of my friends who does social media up in Seattle, uh, Stephanie Wilson, she got hooked on it. And so I started using Yeah, I, I assume the story was a negative story. Yeah. yeah. So she said she stopped using the services because she has a friend in Seattle that experienced something. She was sitting at a, at a function, just like we are right now, wondering about, hey, I just walked into Canopy, you know. Right. And then some guy called up the place looking for her and asked her questions. And I don't know, it just all kind of, it freaked her out. So it freaked her out. And then, you know, yeah. Yeah, it's not worth it for you at that point, yes. You know, I just said, you know, my safety is more important. And Definitely. And, and I'm even talking about men. It's not just a women thing, you know? Yeah, I, I think she makes a very valid point. There is a whole lot of security that goes along with this thing. Um, as, I mean, I, to, be, to, to present the counterpart, there was a point in time when 
nobody in here would ever put their credit card in online to make an online purchase because my mom was like, they're going to steal your credit card information, you know, so, and now everybody doesn't mind putting their credit card in at all. I, I feel like this stuff will evolve, and I, I, I hope and I pray that the human nature and the human condition will evolve with it and that it doesn't become that, but there is always that issue. And I think it's very important, not just for people in this room who are you know, our generation, but think about the younger kids who are using this, 13, 14 year old kids where predators can follow you and see where you've checked in at a four square or something like that. So it, it is a concern and I do appreciate you bringing that up, but uh, hopefully, like I said, the human condition will evolve as well. Yes, sir? Without, without sounding too paranoid, uh, one, of, one of the things also you've got to understand besides marketers, tracking where you're going at what times and you know it's like oh my gosh he, he, he went to the bar at 1 30. or your boss seeing that yeah yeah i mean is my also, boss here no okay good that people like the nsa is probably aggregating that and profiling people and again not to sound paranoid but they're just going to take that and well you know uh, you know and they pull the hood off of you and the lights on you and sure they got this database of all your activities so yeah i i think that's very interesting to bring up and a lot of people will say the same thing about uh, advertisers so right. on facebook you go in and you do a bunch of stuff and you're like oh my god all these advertisers are finding ways to target me directly and then i'm thinking to myself is that a bad thing ask yourself the same question is that really a bad thing like would i rather see ads for well i mean if, it's a bad thing when you're a 27 year old male and all you see on the sideline or on the side of your Facebook is like personal ads with half naked women because apparently that's my target demographic. <laughs> Who knew? But you know, if I click on like if I click on like football or something like that, I would rather see a football ads come in on my sidebar than something that's completely arbitrary. Um, I know our CEO has a long story about how he got sick of certain ads showing up because. Uh, for one, he clicked on one thing once just to check it out and all of a sudden it started to flood. So he went back and started clicking everything he could possibly do to like change his ads on the side, you know, like weird stuff like that, like that that happens. But to answer your point directly, um, I, I would like to believe that as David Stagg, I am a moral and ethical guy <laughs> and that I haven't killed anybody or really done anything that's worthy of being profiled. Sure, if I do go kill somebody and they pull me in, I'll say, yeah, I was on Facebook and I said I like guns, buddy. Uh, you know, uh, but yeah, I mean, yes, it, it, it can be creepy in a sense, but it's, yeah. it's something is, I mean, that's on a global scale, but something as small as like advertisements, I don't see it as such a big deal. Yes, Kane? And just take it one step further and tell me how, I mean, you're talking about advertising. Sure. Which is one way to, to take this data, but as a lot of marketers sitting in the room Yeah, um, that that kind of goes to like, and I'm going to use Amazon.com as an example because I think it's like one of the, you know, obviously it's probably the world's most online best-selling, I don't know, marketplace. I don't know. Uh, side note: Has anybody actually seen a picture of their uh, their warehouse? Go Google it when you get back. It's incredible. It's freaking huge and amazing, and it's like. You mean the one in, in the Dallas yeah, area that uh -huh. was on the news yesterday because they're closing it? No, I didn't see. I didn't see that. <laughs> well, then don't go look at that. Change the subject. Uh, I'll use I'll use Amazon.com as an example. Um, when people when marketers actually go in and they aggregate that kind of data, they can go in and they can look at reviews of you know my friends. If I want to go check out, okay, I want to buy the next you know I don't, I don't know Band of Forces record or something like that. If I want to actually see if it's good or not, I can actually go in and see my Facebook friends uh, reviews of it on there. I don't have to worry about some arbitrary third party person. Hey Melda. I don't have to worry about some kind of arbitrary third person like saying, oh yeah, this is the best record of all time or some kind of music junkie who, you know, claims to know, you know or music snob saying, oh, well, it's the best, but it's not as good as their old stuff or anything like that. I can look at the people who, the, who I really trust. Um, I don't know if I actually answered your question. Well, how do you integrate these kinds of third party services into your website to make it more relevant? Okay. Um, let me think about that, Cammie. Uh, when, what we do with our websites right now is the best way that we've found so far to integrate uh, Facebook is using the like button. And it's, it's, it's as simple as that. We find clients don't really want the Facebook box or anything like that because it's, it takes away from their branding, kind of like we talked about earlier. It's a little clunky. It's not as attractive as you know, some of the other things. Um, 
But I, clients still find it amazing when they go to their site and they're logged in as their own Facebook, like a CEO, and they see that some of their friends have actually liked their company in their sidebar. You know, simple stuff like that. We do the IKEA Houston website and we put the like button at the top of that and we log in and I see four or five different ones of my friends' names every time I log in. I'm thinking to myself, I knew that guy got that thing from IKEA. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, that's kind of the basis of how we use it now. Um, I'm getting ready to talk about the web as an application, um, and I, I, I want to reiterate that I, I see Facebook, like you said, as a third-party tool that kind of integrates in with these other things, and so we'll kind of see uh, parts of that in these applications that I'm going to kind of look at, um, but I, so I guess I'll get to that. Let me get to that in a second, Cami. How about that? So, <laughs> any other questions or comments we move on? Cool. I'm going to go ahead and move on. Um, this is the meat of this whole presentation right here. I don't know if anybody back over here can see this or anything like that. I know that you cannot see this, so I'll read it for you over there. Um, this says the web is an application. The next generation website looks like what we conventionally know as a computer application. So it's, what has happened is we've gotten so used to mobile being mobile over here and websites being websites over here. And contrary to popular belief, our company does websites from concept to completion. That is our job. That is what we do. But we always get people calling asking, okay, well, can you do our web app too? They don't realize that there's actually a disconnect between this. We actually have other people that we refer to to do the web apps, like for Chrome or for Android or for uh, doing like an iPhone app. So there's this disconnect. But what I'm telling you is it's all going to come back around. And as we go through some of these applications, you'll see that eventually these web apps that we know as mobile and portability may not even exist in the future. So um, I think that with things like uh, HTML5, CSS3, um, advanced programming languages, JavaScript, we can take what's known as a conventional website and do way, way more with it than we ever possibly could. And with advanced web browsers, we can actually target like 90% of the users of the internet. And as the government gets on board, you know, think about a day when maybe there may be free Wi-Fi everywhere in the nation. You know, um, I used to live in New York City, and Columbia University had free Wi-Fi for everybody, and it extended well beyond Columbia University just because they wanted people to be on the web in their area. So. I think what the next generation website will look like is what we conventionally know as a computer application. So I'm going to uh, kind of do a little demo here. Anybody that can't really see this, it's going to kind of suck, but I'll kind of try to explain it. <laughs> okay, so what I've got pulled up here is just a Chrome web browser. Um, I don't know if anybody here uses Chrome if you're still using <laughs> Firefox. Um, I use Chrome when I can, but as a developer, I use Firefox because I love Firebug, if anybody's in here doing that. Uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, so this is what is uh, just when you hit control T and you hit a new tab, this is Chrome. So you'll see that they have this new section called apps up here. So I don't know if anybody's actually ever played with Chrome web apps. Yeah, I'm sure, I bet you have. I don't know if anybody's ever actually played with Chrome web apps, but there's some pretty amazing stuff. Normally what you can do is you can go to NewYorkTimes.com and you can read your news or something like that. But the New York Times developed a web app, so I've already got it pulled up over here. So it looks like this. Now, the crazy thing is you can kind of filter through everything that you want over here, customize. So if we want to go check out our top news, we want to check out our opinion over here. Uh, you know, I'm a sports guy, so we can look at all the sports stories, uh, anything here that deals with sports. And you know what? I'm actually going to customize this a little bit. I don't like that look. Let's go with this look instead. Let's go, you know, maybe I don't like that look. Let's go with this look instead. Uh, you know, that's not really for me. Maybe I'll go with this priority look. And it's all like this. Do you know what I mean? And that's something that an iPhone app can never do. Um, I, I think this is pretty, pretty incredible. Um, there's another example of the Huffington Post. I don't know if anybody reads the Huffington Post, but this doesn't look anything like their website, which, uh, yeah, yeah, they, yeah, well, definitely does for a, a lot of money. Um, this is the Huffington Post Chrome web app. Now, instead of it looking like the Drudge Report where it's yelling at you every five seconds, this is a much more cleaner, sleeker style of view. So you can do the same types of things where you can, you know, check out your political news, go through that, you can go through your entertainment news, but it's in a much more beautiful, slick, um, more like an application. And this doesn't, this doesn't feel or feel and acts more like an application. It feels like if we looked at this eight years ago with something you'd have to download as a .exe file and have them warn you not to open because you were scared that it was going to put a virus on your computer. Here's another one up here. This is GrooveShark. Does anybody actually use GrooveShark? Yeah? Excellent. So what, what does this look like? Anybody? Looks like iTunes. I mean, they, they have the same, I mean, it, it's, 
iTunes takes up so many resources on your computer. If you don't have a new computer and you launch iTunes, you're probably waiting for about 30 minutes. Like it's a serious, it's a serious issue how much time it runs. But you can launch this in your browser, hit play, and before you know it, you've got music going on. You can have your, you know, and this is one of many services I prefer, Groove Shark. Um, but you can uh, upload your own music to here. You can create your own playlists. All of it lives off your computer, so you don't have to actually waste the space. They take care of all that for you, and you can access it anywhere. They even have an iPhone app, so you can go ahead and access it from there as well. So I believe uh, as we move forward, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the websites are going to start to feel and function more like this, uh, more like a computer application rather than a website. So um, I'm going to do another little demo here. And it's me singing karaoke! Just kidding. I'm not going to do that. So like I said earlier, um, there is a disconnect right now between websites and applications. Our, like I said, our company actually does the website portion, but we don't do the application portion. They're two completely different things. So right now I'm going to do show you a couple things on the iPad that are pretty cool, just so if you want to take them back. I call them iPad productivity or whatever, but you can take for it whatever it, you will. Hopefully this will go pretty quickly because we're always dependent on Wi-Fi. So this is an application called Splashtop. Has anybody ever heard of Splashtop? <coughs> anybody? OK. Excellent. So all, all you have to do is install Splashtop on your computer, like in this case, this laptop right here. And then you just download the app on your iPad right here. So give me two seconds. I have to type in my password, which happens to be the most ridiculous password known to man. No. <laughs> Do you work at Twitter? You say it was Splash Top? Splash Top, like uh, S P L A S H T O P. Hopefully, this will work here. So, do y'all see this? Now I'm connecting to my computer. Now I have full control. Now I have full control over my computer from here. So, if I actually wanted to run this presentation from back over here, I actually could. So, if you wanted to listen to something like. Firework by Katy Perry, you know, we could do that. If you prefer something else. Karaoke. Yeah, exactly. We could do karaoke. But you see how, like, I can do a whole presentation and be more interactive from something like this. Um, I could go back to my actual presentation and continue the presentation talking to y'all from over here just by using my iPad. I think that's pretty cool. Um, and what's also cool is. Um, you can view Flash on your iPad if you're hooked up to a computer because your computer can't. Do y'all follow? So like, if I can't actually get to the website with Flash, I could just remote into my laptop, take this baby, and just watch whatever I want in my bed just because my computer's up on the, you know, the mantle or something like that. So. And you do that through Splashtop? Yes, you do it through Splashtop. So Splashtop is an app. You install the app on your iPad. You install the application on your actual computer, and you have full control over it. All you got to do is make sure that it scans for your computer and you give your computer a password so that, like, because right now if anybody in here had the Splashtop app, you could probably try to take over my computer and, like, sabotage me. Uh, so, and the other cool thing is, is, you know that, like, really awkward moment when you're in a presentation and you, like, try to hook something up and then you unplug it and everything looks crazy and your icons are everywhere on the screen. Everybody's experienced that before. If I just actually hit the close button on that app, it goes right back to normal. So everything's actually exactly how I left it before, which is like one of my favorite things. And this just looks like it normally does. So, yes, ma'am? Do you have to be in the same place? Like, do you have to be in Wi-Fi? Yeah, uh, yes, that is a good point. You have to be on the same Wi-Fi network. So for most people, that's not an issue because I don't know why you would use it. Uh, I mean, I could see you wanting to use it like if you're on a plane or something like that from back home. Yeah, something like that. So yeah, you do have to be on the same wireless network. Yes, ma'am? Uh, I don't know that it might it might be an iPad uh, it might be an i I'm sorry an iPhone app for it I haven't I haven't actually investigated that but we use this for like for example in our office we have uh, monitors exactly like this posted around our office that uh, scroll through our websites like that our company does so when clients come in they can see our work um, well sometimes that computer that's hidden in a server room that has a key because it's a bunch of servers in there that thing back over there. Uh, it's, it's hard to get to, it's annoying, so one of our programmers got sick of going back there every time. He just installed Splashtop, and so he just walks out into the office and does all the updates from his, iP I, uh, from his iPad, so he doesn't actually have to go back in and mess with the server room or anything like that. So that's a more practical application of how we use this thing, rather than just walk around and play Katy Perry for you guys, which is, you know, cool in its own, cool in its own right. 
Um, has anybody ever heard of the iPad app Boxy? B-O-X-E-E. -E. This thing is pretty, pretty cool. So I installed it for my brother and just to make sure that it would work. I don't have a demo for you today, but let me kind of explain how it works. So what you can do is you can go buy one of those Mac minis, you know, those things that are about this big that probably have more uh, hard drive space than you'll ever possibly need. And you can set that next to your TV. If you get just a regular VGA or HDMI cable, you can hook it up to your computer so your monitor is actually your TV, you follow? If you turn Boxy on on your actual uh, Mac Mini and then have the Boxy app on your iPad so they can, so they can talk, same kind of concept with Splash Talk, um, Boxy is actually a media center application. So what my brother does is he sets up all of his uh, downloads to download to one folder and then when he, all he does is switch his uh, input to that Mac Mini, Boxy's already running and he has every single video, every single movie, every single piece of music, every single photo ready for access that he can then move through on his iPad. So he never actually has to leave his uh, bed, which for better or for worse uh, <laughs> is there. So it, it's, it's really, really cool. And if you want to get ridiculous with it, there's a kid at our work who's just... I have this phrase where <laughs> laziness breeds innovation and <laughs> he, he didn't want to get up. <laughs> so you have to do something pretty incredible to make sure that you don't get up. So when it came to Boxy, he has it so that it automatically scans Hulu or wherever, automatically pays for it, automatically downloads it, renames it as it's supposed to be done, converts it, puts it in the right folder, and then when he gets home from work that day, he can watch The Office just by turning on his TV and going to that thing. You know what I mean? It's like the ultimate DVR, and he doesn't even have to worry about whether it's going to record or whether it's going to stop late or whether it's going to stop early or anything like that. So uh, check it out. That one's called Boxy, B-O-X-E-E. -E. Boxy has an iPhone app where you can use your iPhone as a mouse, so you don't have to... Yeah, exa exactly. Yeah, and it works on your iPhone and your iPad. So what you see on Boxy when you actually turn on your iPad is just this little like remote control in the square, and it just uses gestures like it's a mouse. So all you got to do is just kind of move around and click on your videos and then click which one you want to watch. It's pretty incredible. So it functions similarly to Splash Top, but is more focused on media. And the really cool thing is it's smart enough to know if you download something and it's like Friday Night Lights, SP3, you know, whatever, it will find the, the box cover for the show. It will actually put out a debt, like the description, like you're actually looking at it on one of those red box DVDs or something like that. So it's, in a, pretty, it's a pretty incredible application. Um, I'm gonna, has anybody ever heard of Adobe Ideas? And this is, uh, this is something that more because I'm kind of a geek when it comes to uh, web design. This is basically it. It's, it's, it's free to download. It's from Adobe. It's a, it's a tracing application. You may think that's not very much, but a lot of times we go out to client sites and we actually, you know, we're doing a kickoff meeting or we're doing a sales meeting or something like that. And as they're talking, I can kind of start doing one of these things where I go, pause for the cause, people. Okay, so you want something that's like a uh, header up over here, you know, you may want a main rotator right here with some text here, you want a couple of calls to action right here, and then you want your body content to be down here, and all of a sudden the client sees it, and they're like, yeah, I kind of get that. And in a sales process, they can see the salesman, you know, thinking about their, um, thinking about their actual calls to action, their areas to market, what they actually want their people to see. And then all I have to do is hit this little button, and then I can just go ahead and email that back to the office real quick, and I don't even have to worry about it anymore. You know, who needs paper and pen? Nobody. Nobody needs that anymore. Go use Evernote. So. Has anybody ever heard of, uh, this one's probably a little more popular, iPhone Square? Nobody? Anybody? I, I, you have? Excellent. I'm glad somebody has. Oh, well, not surprising. iPhone Square is the next generation in taking payments for the iPhone. And I yeah. wish that I forgot that I, I wish I have one. I forgot it today, but do you have one? Excellent. This guy saves the day. I'm going to go steal his square. No, you can't steal it. <laughs> It's pretty smart to put it in a little baggie. Here, I'll let you. My hands aren't working. No so problem. <laughs> okay, this thing right here. So hopefully, all of y'all can see this. Y'all see that? Yeah. It's this little square of a device. 
Um, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was the other guy from Twitter that left Twitter that he started this. Um, all you do is download the Square app, which is totally free, and it looks like, let me pull it up here. It looks like this, I don't know how many of y'all can see this, but it basically just got like a dollar amount in like a little place like that. Can y'all see all that? So all, the only thing that I have to do is plug this into my earphone, and now what it does is that you actually run your credit card through it like that, and it actually takes your payment through your phone. So this goes into a bank on your Square account that you've signed up for. Does that make sense? And the really badass thing is you sign using your finger on the iPhone. You know what I mean? So it swipes it for 20 bucks. You go in, and then they say, okay, well, you know, are you supposed to sign at the store? You just use your finger to sign. It's pretty incredible. Okay. I'm going to cover up my number if that's okay with you. <laughs> Cammy, I know your affiliation for Prada. <laughs> Security first, Cammy. Here you are, thank you. Yeah, uh, it's, the, it's the same kind of scary as Mint.com, in my opinion. Right, yeah, so um, preface all of this by saying, yes, security is definitely number one. Is it mainly for the accessibility that makes it scary and the fact that people already, I mean, there are already devices out there, but they're not as, I guess, mainstream? Right, right. Exactly, and and yeah, and that can happen, but that could that can happen anyway. I mean, yeah. I can give my credit card to a canopy, which they would never ever do. <laughs> hey, who's your competitor? <laughs> they would do it. They would write down your number, and then they, you know, that that kind of stuff happens. That exists. But like I said earlier, I hope that the human condition can evolve at least a little bit with the you know the new mediums that we have. Um, and like I was saying. Mint.com scares the crap out of me. I do not use it. I know a lot of people that do use it. I'm, do, you, do you use it? Um, who absolutely love it. But I do not trust every single piece of my financial information with them. And what scared me even more is recently Mint.com came out with a top 10 places that Houstonians eat. Have you all heard of this? It's like you don't, you don't, have, you don't look at my data, but... I mean, okay, I guess maybe I'm anonymous, but you looked at my data, you know, it's like a little, it's like a little strange. Number one, Starbucks, number two, McDonald's, number three, Taco Cabana. Way to go, Houston. <laughs> so. And now we're gonna bring it all together. So has anybody ever heard of the CR48? Besides you, because I know you signed up for it. A couple guys, a few people. Yeah, I bet you do. So let me show you what the CR48 is. It's not how from the year 2001 or something like that. This is Google's new bet. This is Google's laptop. The only thing that this laptop does is run Chrome. That's the only thing that this laptop does. And they, want, they expect you to buy this. And you want to know why? Because this is what the home screen looks like. Exactly like what we just saw. It has all of your apps right there. The web is going to look like a bunch of applications in the future. Uh, you want to make a video, you go get a flip cam, uh, you go out, you take your video, you plug it in your USB at that point, your USB goes straight to here, you can do it online, video edit online, save to the cloud, the cloud, you can save to the cloud, you, don't need, you can post it to YouTube at that point, you can share it at Facebook, they're making a huge bet that this is the future of the web. And you know, if Google's going to invest in this. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I do believe that I see all websites moving more towards this, which is why I find something like the CR8, uh, CR48 incredibly interesting, incredibly intriguing, because I would love to see how it does. Now, I'm, the rumor is it's still like a couple years out. Uh, I know that you can request to get one. I know Kami's already done that, and she's hoping it comes in tomorrow. The deadline is already passed. Deadline's passed. So sorry for everybody else who hasn't already signed up for one. But um, well, the, the, what they said is that they, they're going to tell you if you'll give you one. It'll just show up at your door. They made you fill out an application, ah, a see. Google application. Right, of course. You know, and then you, and then they said if if, if you get chosen, if you're one of the you know day chosen because you have 
<laughs> whatever credentials that it may be. Uh -huh. and, and, but, they, but they actually wanted business people. They wanted to know how you use it for your business. Okay, cool. And when you go home, it'll be there, right? Absolutely. Okay, good. That's hope. Loud. That's hope. Um, I, and we, we can see this kind of trend everywhere. I mean, I was experiencing this literally just yesterday. I, was, I had my notes for this presentation in a Microsoft Word document, but I was moving it from my work computer to this laptop right here. Well, I hadn't yet installed Microsoft Word on this laptop, and so I couldn't read it. And I was like, well, crap, what am I going to do? Then I remember Google Docs can open that for me, so I didn't even have to use Microsoft Word despite the extension. Do you know what I mean? If you want to pull up an Excel spreadsheet, you can use Google, what is it called? Google Numbers, Google, what? Oh, okay, it's all Google Docs now, so your Docs is your Excel spreadsheet. I mean, that's insane stuff, and I even talked to a guy in our office who believes at a certain point, extensions are gonna go away. It's just gonna be this, it's just gonna be files. I mean, if there's something as versatile as Google Docs that can take any kind of Microsoft Office document and open it, I'm sure it can eventually do PowerPoint. I don't even know if it does right now. But you already, see, it does, so it, I mean, it, you're already seeing this trend happen where your applications are moving online and the web as we know it is moving more towards what we conventionally know as a computer application. So, I have a quote here. Will apps even exist in the future? This is Jim Kerr from Mashable and I'm gonna read this for the people who can't see. He says, content specific device apps are at best going to be disrupted and at worst going to be phased out entirely. And he's talking about things like applications on the iPhone or applications on the iPad. So what we saw was the web, there was a need for the web to be portable. We got that and then we realized, hey, we can do this better and actually make the web portable rather than create this other device. So things like, things like the iPad are now presenting that to us. Do you know what I mean? Who's to say that in two to three years, the government or whomever it is has privatized it, makes Wi-Fi av available everywhere in the United States and then this is my CR48, where I just open this and this runs my Chrome apps. You know what I mean? There's no reason that that can't happen in the next two to three years. No reason at all. I mean, we're already starting to see that kind of stuff. That would absolutely kill uh, what he's calling content-specific device apps, or as we know it. So I just put the next two to three years. Anyone? Bueller? <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, that, that, that's kind of where I view as the next generation website. Are there any questions or comments or concerns? Yes, ma'am? I sure wish these programmers would think ahead and think about businesses in the future. Instead of killing everything, <laughs> yeah. um, they should be thinking about how can we make the businesses more profitable and how do we get more businesses making money? Yeah, I wish they'd think like that. Yeah, they're hurting a consumer, but they sure as heck are making profit for themselves. Business, well, yes, businesses, sure. Okay, and, and you know, even our job, what you do and what I do, okay, mm -hmm. you know, there's big guys that are always over us, you know, trying to get every little piece of the pie from us. Sure. So, you know, it's a very competitive world. So, you know, you cut out this, you cut out that, and it's like, we already cut out the middle, middle structure of America already. Mm -hmm. See you later, Cammy. Right? <laughs> yeah. Then we go and move all the manufacturers out of the country, so now we don't even have that. Right. And so I, we're going to have to make some money somewhere, and these programmers up in San Francisco need to start thinking about business and not cutting out everything. Right. And I, the, I'm going to counter with you with one point, and <laughs> I, I totally believe that what these programmers or businesses have done has helped our company. And uh, I don't have the exact numbers, but my CEO is sitting back there, and he could tell you we currently spend something like thirteen thousand, fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars a year on server costs. I mean, a lot. And we're going to move to Amazon Web Services, which is going to save us God knows how much money, just because these people have allowed us to use their service for much cheaper. Makes sense. So there is a counter argument to to that. Uh, anyway, yeah. but yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I totally understand. Like they, you know, they need to get their focus in the right direction so that we all make money, not yeah. this guy, cut out this guy, let's cut all, all the competition out. You cut all the competition out, you're, you're cutting out us. We're business people. We all got to make money to eat. We got to eat, right? Yep. Cool. So they need to get their focus in the 
but again, they're making money for their investors. Yeah. You know, and that's good. That breeds that that benefits all of us. I mean, you know, I mean. Who gets the money? Google, the big guy. Well, well we get we see the next generation. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. It, it's cool. But, uh, like I was saying, moving on. I, uh, I saw a question back here. Did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I was going to say regarding your comment about the something like Sierra Forty Eight wiping out the you know, content or device mm -hmm. specific applications mm -hmm. in the next two to three years. Um, you know, I've only been in this business thirty plus years, and and about every two to three years, I hear that particular. Absolutely, thing. yeah. You know, client server. The web was going to wipe out client server. Client server was yep. going to wipe out. Um, you know, so I'm. I'm, I'm You'll have to forgive me if I a little bit. No, no, I, I actually love what you said, and that's the reason that this slide exists. Because I don't know. I can predict. I can guess. I can see where things are going. We can see trends, and we can see how things move. But from what I see, it, it may not be two to three years, but it could be a little bit longer. Yes, Kim? Um, kind of moving this back to the practical and bringing back my question that you promised to answer. Yes. Oh. <laughs> is how, do you, um, how do you take all of this? Like, what should we be doing with our website? Right, so let's, let's, take, let's take GrooveShark, for example. If GrooveShark is your website and this is your company, what they've done is they've integrated sharing capabilities of your, of your playlists and of your actual songs and of your actual content into their application. That's what you need to be doing with your website. So right now, I can create a playlist and I can share it on Facebook with my friends and they can go back to GrooveShark, create their own account or follow me and um, you know, listen to the songs that I like. So to, that, I meant to... I meant to do that when I was up on that screen and I forgot about it. But um, yeah, you can. That, that's what you guys should be doing. You should be focusing on ways to actually get this, use these third-party tools to actually extend your reach of your business um, from your home base. You know, it's like these are your outposts, and you actually have a home base here and your website. So you definitely want to do that. But you, when you can bring more people in, it's kind of like this right now. My home base. When I'm done here, I'm going back to Shipple. That's what I'm going to do. But I've come out here and I've said shipple a billion times. If you want a website, come talk to me afterwards. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Do you know what I mean? That's what that's what this does, but online. So, yes. I haven't seen you in a while. Yeah, been a while. How are you? Good. 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 Yep. It's only work in Chrome. Mm -hmm. So it's it's like, you know, people were hesitant to build iPhone apps until the iPhone got to that production <coughs> point where it made sense. Same thing with Android and Absolutely. You know, everything. So it's one of those things where it may not happen in the next two or three years, but you're totally right. You're gonna be there at least in the next five. Yeah, I, I arbitrarily pick two to three years just because the web moves so fast. But you know, like it, Five years, you know, sure. I mean, look where we were five years ago. I mean, look how quickly Facebook pro pro progressed in five years. I mean, if we had that kind of growth, I mean, they weren't even cash positive until like late 2009, 2010. <laughs> Think about that. But they were valued at like $80 billion. I mean, that, there's like a serious disconnect there. So when the web moves so fast, I mean, like you said, I arbitrarily pick two to three uh, years. It could be five years. But... Um, I'll tell you what, the more and more I go through my office, I think I see Chrome being used more than any other browser, and that's without somebody saying Chrome's a better browser. That's just people saying, oh, that looks pretty cool, and realizing it works faster or better, you know, meets some kind of need that they have that other browsers weren't. So, uh, I got just a little bit more. Kimmy, I don't know how we're doing on time. We're, we're doing fine. Um, does anybody have any specific questions about your own situation, your own work situation that you can kind of... Sure. Yes, ma'am. I have a question that um, may be a bit tangential, uh, and you may not want to discuss it right now. But okay. Are we concerned at all about um, the digital divide and the, even the, divi the digital divide among people who have computers, and yet, um, and I'm thinking of this, my own professional association sure. has, you know, um, people that are just now going, oh, what's, what's Facebook? Maybe I should do yeah. it. So um, they, someone actually sent me a question about what can I do instead of Facebook so that nobody can can send me an ad, nobody can see what I'm posting. I'm like, why are you even on yeah. social media? Yeah. And so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, um, do, do we just leave those people in the dust? I, I, and, absolutely <laughs> not. Do and, and, you want to feel that one? 
I, well, the only thing I was going to say is the most important thing that I can say to you, and this is what we do with our clients all the time, client education. They just don't know. That's the number one thing is they just don't know. And there will, people who, there will be people who don't you know, get on board of the train, but those were the people that thought Betamax was going to make it. You know what I mean? Eventually, they bought a VHS player. You know what I mean? It's, it's kind of like the theory of, uh, I'm not going to get too, like, uh, too crazy about it, but what happens in five years if the government takes over the internet and gives everybody free Wi-Fi and demands that they have a computer because that's the way they want to run the census now? You know what I mean? Like, to, to say that... <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> you must work for the government. <laughs> so, but who's to say that's not going to happen? Who's to say that's not going to happen? So, like I said, I don't totally have an answer for you, but right now, here in the now, in this immediate day, client education is the best thing that you can possibly do. And if they say no, you say, I tried. So, yes, ma'am? The only other thing I'm going to say is that for um, the digital divide, I believe that the proliferation of cheap smartphones yeah. is really going to make a huge dent in that because the people that would never have bought a computer now are going, I mean, HTC, like they're lowering and lowering the bar for like the Android, for example. Definitely. Like, you know, they're getting people in like really at the very ground floor, but uh, with that and app, uh, I mean, really, there's, uh, it's going to blow the doors off of that. And that's why it's so important for your website to be mobile as well. Or not, a mobile version necessarily, but the HTML5. Right, accessible via some kind of smartphone or something like that, absolutely. I, I would say not just smartphones, but things, not only the, the things like the iPod Touch and that kind of device, mm -hmm. but even the proliferation of tablets and the you know, iPad oh, yeah. kicked off. And, and now we're getting a billion of those things show up. And, and if, they, if they become successful, it'll drive the cost down where I mean, eventually they will start giving them out at the schools, and I think that will help. Too. Exactly, and they're already giving out laptops at certain schools, yeah. as far as I understand. So, I mean, I, ideally, that's where we'll go. Um, so, it, it's it's a pretty cool future. It's also a pretty scary future. So, who knows? Yes, Kami. It's not um, this big, the internet thing. We we are the internet. We make right. it up. So, a lot of the decisions that, that happen with the internet are driven by us. So, we get to choose. We get to demand, right? Yeah, well... For our business, especially for our websites and our businesses, she she was saying that we are the internet. Don't forget that, is that the internet isn't this like colossal thing that exists on its own and then you know becomes self-aware and takes us over. It's like we actually do have a part in this. And so when you have control over your website and your business, you do get a part in that. So, all right, I'm going to show you uh, just a couple more examples here. So your CEO said the phrase ROI. Anybody experienced that one? Yeah. It's like the worst word you could ever possibly hear. So ways to measure the goals ahead of the game. So these are things that you can do like right now when you go back to your office um, to kind of give them some kind of number, which they always want, so that to show that this was worth it. And my CEO is sitting in the back. So, so this is the Houston Zoo's website. We take care of the Houston Zoo. Um, what I'm going to point out here is I'm going to kind of move back so hopefully people over here can see it is this make a donation button is giant and red in the top right. I wonder why. Can anybody see that? So there's a big red, like, do you see that thing? Everybody see that? It's a big red button, everything like that. Okay, well, that's probably one of the more important things to the Houston Zoo as it's a nonprofit organization. We follow? So we, the CEO wants to make sure that that button is clicked, right? It's a big red button, but, you know, there were differing opinions in that meeting, probably a lot of chefs in that kitchen, and they all said, well, I don't know if red's gonna work. You know, I don't really like the color red. Well, red really bothers me, so like, all right, we'll go with red. So they start out with red, but that's just a link. That's just a link on the page. So Google has this thing called the URL tool builder. If you go to bit.ly slash URL tool, you actually take that link and you put it in, it asks you for it, and you can create what they call a campaign. So all the three things that you are required to fill out are the campaign source. If you can't see this, I'm going to kind of try to read it for you. The campaign source, the campaign medium, and the campaign name. So I named uh, my campaign source zoo underscore home underscore page. I named my medium nav underscore btn for button. And I named my campaign name btn underscore ab underscore test. Do you follow so far? So instead of using the original link that I would have linked to houstonzoo.org slash donate, I click this button that says generate URL and it gives me this new link that I actually use instead of the old link. 
everybody on board so far? So now that we have Google Analytics installed on their actual website, when we go to our analytics, it actually shows us how many clicks on that campaign you can, that they've got. So I, I know it's hard for you all to see, but this says red button right here, and it shows how many visits have been clicked through it based on the last month from January 1st to February 9th. Everybody follow? So let's say after January, we decide, okay, well, we gave Holly her shot. She wanted red. Now, what if we made it green? It's the color of money. It may be you know, a little bit softer on the eyes. People may find it a little more inviting than a harsh color like red. We go back to the URL tool using the same exact link and then using the same three fields. We change red button to green button, create this new link, and then replace the old link. Still goes to the same place on our website, but now Google's tracking me a new campaign. So after two months, we can actually go in and see, did the red button do well, or did the green button do well? So that's something you can take home with you today. Um, and then there's something about cost savings. I want to tell a little story about how Shipple used our own human network to bring in clicks to our website. Um, we were previously running PPC campaigns, and we basically, without getting too into it, we basically va valued each click at about a dollar. So every click that came from PPC, we basically valued at about a dollar. Well, our CEO had the wonderful idea of buying this ridiculous animal named Chris Christopherson off an eBay site from a woman named the Blog S. Has anybody ever heard of her? Okay, exactly. So we go in and we buy this ridiculous animal for $112. $112 for a ridiculous animal. And I would never do it. But Ed was like, this is a really good idea, trust me. And everybody looked at him like, you're insane. So we bring it back, and then it turns out the Blog S went in and made a post about this on her website saying, Shipple is stupid. You spent $112 on this ridiculous Chris Christopherson thing. But you know what? It generated 800 something clicks for $112. We were paying a dollar a click beforehand and we got 800 and something from $112. So then we all went to Ed and we're like, uh, I wanna hate you. <laughs> So there's power in the people you know. There's, the, there's a reason that every single one of you all are here right now. And it's so you can meet each other and you can talk. And who knows who's going to be the next blog guest? Who knows who's going to be the next Cami? Who knows who's going to be the one that actually you buy some ridiculous, <laughs> some ridiculous thing from? Uh, and then at that moment, the computers became self-aware. <laughs> Thanks for watching the video, guys. Once again, my name is David Stagg, Creative Director at Shipple, the web marketing company. Remember to check out some of those apps that we talked about in there. Uh, Splashtop is really cool. I love GrooveShark. Uh, and remember that the next generation website should be a destination and use those tools like Facebook to bring your people to your website. Uh, we hope you had a great time watching. You can follow me on Twitter, at DStagg, or you can follow our company, at Shipple. And we look forward to seeing you online.